I don't think a lot of people understand who who the OCP is, and and once they try to figure that out, the impact that it's already making on them, they just didn't know it. Right, right, right. Like and, that. and that's the way to understand it. That's the way for us to consume it. I think is you know, um, but tell me, so you're from Texas, mm -hmm. born and raised in Houston. Okay, and you went to UT for your, I did. and you live where now? Uh, well, uh, it's interesting you say that. Um, my wife and I sold our my now that we're empty nesters and my son's off to college. We sold our house in Houston a lot faster than we thought, and we haven't bought anything yet. You're homeless, so we're well. We're, we call ourselves uh, digital nomads. For oh, there you so go. I travel a ton for work for OCP, and so oh, that's my wife cool. works virtually. So uh, we just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, and so we went to Europe, and then um, she's just kind of coming along with me. And I've got a brother in Canyon Lake that's got a house that we've been kind of storing our stuff at, but we've got all our furniture and everything awesome. in pods. So, and we're not in any rush to figure out where we're going to go next, you know? Why would you be? Yeah. I would, I think that a lot of people would um, love to not live such a homogenous lifestyle that they get to do that. Well, yeah. in the six months that I just described, the mar the real estate market has changed dramatically. We we sold at the top of our mar of the market mm -hmm. in our neighborhood and things are coming down dramatically just over the last six months. So we're we're thinking we might have timed it just right. So we'll you see. You know, I catch a falling sword right now by buying something while the market still dips. Exactly. Well, I I think that this is uh are you planning on coming back to Texas at some point? Like yeah, we actually have a lot in New Braunfels. We're probably gonna end up in New Braunfels. The beautiful area. Yeah, yeah, we love it. It's small town, but you know, an hour from everything. It's literally, dude, that's a, what do they call them? Bedroom communities to Austin. That that's going to be an explosive community. I mean, it is. It's growing a lot, but it's all growing West. There's not much you can do like in town, like in, in brothels and green. Green is really where we love. Sure. I love that area too. Very cool. And then, um, but you went to school here and then you left. And I mean, why did you like, you don't like your kids very much. You sent them to Oklahoma for school. I'm a terrible parent. So they obviously have a lot of- um, Great uh, school, actually. Actually, what I was going to say is we love OU. Our kids are thriving. It is a vibrant community, very supportive. The faculty, the students, it is a phenomenal community. So our kids are thriving there. We love it. I have a kid that has been interning for us for the last two years from there. And uh, when he graduates, he's a senior. You know, We're hoping to bring him on full time for us. Yeah. I think they produce a lot of really talented kids there. It's so. a great school. So we couldn't be happier. I got you. But, so cool. but come October, it's a little rough. Where are you originally from, Rob? I know that you live in the North Carolina, but yeah. is that where you're from? From? No, I grew up in Chicagoland area. That's right. Yeah. How long have you been in the Carolinas? Thirteen years. It was supposed to be two years. Nice. You in the Raleigh area? Or? Yep. Yep. No. Raleigh suburb. Yeah. It's like everybody tells me it's like Austin ten years, you know, ten years ago. Very like. And it. I think for the last ten years, that's hold true. We're like, it's growing like a weed. It's crazy, but um, it's fun. It's a nice area to grow to I raise kids, Carolinas. and it's great. Yeah, I have a house in Charleston, and um, I just like the Carolinas. I like the Southeast a lot. Beautiful. Such a beautiful area. A lot of history, obviously. Yeah. Um, but talk to me about, like, when you when we started this OCP thing, um, it, it was really a couple groups that are saying, hey, man, this isn't going to scale. And they knew it. So they started changing the market and changed the way that we view approaching problems as a team, collaborative as a community. So they helped drive this community. Yeah. And now this community is tasked with, you know, the needs of standard evolutional growth. But then you have these really crazy things that are slapping them in the face. And which one's worse, AI or quantum, in your opinion? Which one's worse? Which one's going to have the biggest challenge? Which one's going to have the greatest demand on that? I know game? my answer. I'll let you answer first. Well, I, I think right now is AI is, is posing a lot of challenges because we feel like we're still behind from like COVID and growth and demand. And now the the hockey stick we thought we were on has just done this. So people are like, I haven't even got a break yet. And now we're on this next iteration. So I think that's going to change things because in some ways it's going to feel really familiar and it's going to use the same tools. So I don't think people will respect how different it's going to make things. So I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. Well, I'll tell you why. And this is going to be a great opportunity for you to talk about this. And you can talk about this stuff today because I'll tell you this podcast won't, uh, it, it may not hit the street for a couple of weeks, sometimes two to four weeks. So, because uh, we, we're constantly, we have a, a fair amount of that stuff and we, I don't know what the process is, but we're feeding mm -hmm. it out, trying to make sure that people are consuming it uh, in a way that's beneficial, right? We don't want to just put content out for no, no sake. And I know that you are doing a presentation tomorrow at DCAC on stage talking about open compute. And just, I think there's a lot of things that are gonna open eyes for people. As an example, just in a one brief conversation with you, 
Um, you're like, yeah, yeah, every time that you do a chat GBT question, this is what the demand of power is from mm -hmm. AI as a byproduct of that. Get, what's like, throw some nuggets out here. Don't, I mean, don't worry about spilling any of your stuff that you're going to use tomorrow right. because that tomorrow will hit before this hits. Right. But for those that won't be at DCAC, I mean, we won't have 4,000 people. We're lucky to get a thousand, right? Mm -hmm. But um, but let's say more than 60 or 70% of them are sitting there for your panel that's still not as many people as what we could get with this microphone sure. maybe. So what are those impacts that AI has on power demand right now that some people don't even understand? Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to quantify because you don't know exactly where it's happening, right, is one of the challenges. So it's in the cloud, right? That's where when you <laughs> sit down and you, or you grab your app and you type into chat GPT. Um, and even if you ask chat GPT, I asked them like, how much power do you use? And it's like, well, I don't know. I mean. You should be concerned. Trained. <laughs> yeah, you should be concerned that it doesn't want to answer that question <laughs> directly. Um, and you know, I've heard other people. I've heard you know Bill Kleiman, you know, say say things like you know it could charge your phone one. You know, like sitting down asking Chat GPT a handful of times, like you might be able to charge your phone like tens of times, maybe as many as sixty times over per question. Per, yeah, or like it's like Whatever four it questions, is. like a session. few questions. Yeah, but yes, yeah, a few questions. That's what the power. Like people are like, this is incredible. I could ask it what my favorite color is. Every time I do that, boom, 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 and it's That's just right. power hitting. It's people don't realize that. it's thousands of Google searches. Yes, like four questions to ChatGPT is thousands upon thousands of Google searches. And that's how different the efficiency is. The other one that's huge that shocked me is every session's a bottle of water. Mm. Every question's a bottle of water? Yes. Because that's how much cooling it takes from the manufacturing of every component that goes into a data center and the element of cooling in itself? No, from the cooling of the data center environment. Just the cooling. Just the cooling. Not the manufacturing. Yeah, that makes way so sense. So if, if you look at, um, and I forget, it's somewhere in the Midwest. But Hold on. I, I want to make sure that you say that again so yeah. people listen, because that's bananas. Every time you have one of those series of questions, whether it's, it's one, it's two, like or four three, or five, yeah, it's a bottle of water. It's a, every time you sit down for a session at ChatGPT, it's a bottle of water. Think you, about that, guards. Uh -huh. So it came out of the ground, and depending on how that data center was cooled, now it's in the atmosphere, and it'll rain somewhere else eventually, maybe the ocean, but wherever that was consumed, that water is no longer there. And that's amazing. You know, the, to, to back up that data. That's perspective though, right? So there will be people that are listening. Hopefully, you know, my team makes that part of the commercial drip and they do the teaser drips because I'm like, that's ridiculous. People don't know that. No. You look at, um, there's, you know, when Microsoft partnered with and acquired or invested in OpenAI and they brought OpenAI into their data centers, their water consumption went up 30% overnight. Oh, <gasps> From all the demand of additional cooling that came as a byproduct of that need of more power. Got you. All right. Well, look, man. Just the cooling. But it, but hold on a second. So that's the sneakiness. So hold on. Because it feels on. familiar. But how come we couldn't catch that in a OCP lab or some shit? Or like, there's got like, how, how are we beta testing shit in the field still? Like, I figured everything was being done with all you nerds with like slide rulers and shit somewhere in like, I don't know, New Mexico, I guess is where they had, I'm only guessing where you guys do your shit at, right? But like, I'm expecting like nerds to figure these things out before it goes live. See, this is the danger I talked about. Like the reason why this one is hard is because it's gonna surprise everybody. Wow. Including the engineers working on the stuff, including the operators running the data centers, including the construction teams building the data centers. This thing's gonna pull the rug out from underneath us because it feels so familiar because it's using a lot of the same pieces but in a totally different way. So what's interesting is I asked, uh, uh, there's a guy at Cyrus One who's got a big fat brain too, and, and Jim Roach, and he's gonna be, oh, yeah. you know Jim? I know Jim. Awesome guy. And he, I went to their vendor summit and he did a uh, presentation on SMRs, right? And have you guys seen Nuclear Now? It's the mm -hmm. Oliver Stone movie that came out recently. I haven't seen it yet. Fantastic movie. I recommend it to everybody because it really deconstructs this dichotomy of, uh, Nuclear, right? It really separates weapons from energy right. and, and the contribution that energy can make to climate control. And it's readily available now. And there's just the only thing that's getting, it's just, it's a, it's a brand problem. It's, I, it's a, people yeah. think that it's dirty. Well, it's dipshits like Oliver Stone that once were like protesting, no nukes, no, and you're like, listen, man, you're right. No weapons. We don't need that shit. I mean, you have to have them in a world of deterrence, but 
but really there's why are all these fast why are all these submarines and aircraft carriers not sitting on the bottom of the ocean somewhere oh it's because that they're it's possible to to maintain these small modular the reactors pain. yeah and and it turns out that it just takes human beings to have some advanced training and attention to detail and you can run those things forever I think society isn't ready to have nuclear reactors right next to this building. You know, sure. I think that there, there's going to be some pushback on that. But I think that the same people that ruin the optics of how nuclear energy should be viewed are the same ones that should be responsible for helping fix those optics. That's right. Right. Because, and he's doing it to his credit. I mean, I'm not an Oliver Stone you know, <coughs> fan, but, but I could watch something like that and find value in the objectivity of it because he, he really does a great job of helping you understand where uh, we, we we went wrong, you yeah. know, and not and by not adopting nuclear, I think it's inevitable. I think right. that uh, like, are you tracking what like Cumulus is doing in Pennsylvania and all that yeah. stuff? Yeah. Okay, so it's it's like um, anything that's new and emerging. It'll take a little bit of time, and then at some point, what was once crazy? Can you remember when like? A UPS? What the hell do I need a UPS for? Right. And then all of a sudden, like, wait a second, you're telling me now I have to have two in? Like, I'm not, why do I need two UPSs? Right. And now it's like, can you imagine most groups outside of FAMGA are like, I can't imagine not having that. Maybe I should have yeah. a catcher system or some shit, but we're just going to, what once was crazy now Always. becomes the standard. And then later it's like, I can't believe we survived on that. Like, you yeah. want to understand how I feel? Uh, leave your phone at home and go to the grocery store for an hour and a half and come back without it. That's probably how it should feel, right? Like we get so used to things that not happening right. now is crazy. You feel naked without a phone. Or yeah. you feel free and liberated, one of the two. <laughs> Depends. <laughs> probably the latter is better. Yeah. Right. But uh, interesting. So what else is coming from like AI? Those, are you saving your shit for tomorrow? Or is there anything else you could drop on us and what you're seeing for AI's going to rip off the head of cloud and dookie down its neck it looks like it's it's 10x like, fold in a minimum it says it's the it's yeah so demand is higher is 10 times yeah um what can be served right now you know there's stats of like if you were to ship is that even real i think it's almost so big that people are like mm. yeah and i think even if you were to say this is hype right and you were to question it and go oh we're in a big hype cycle and lots of new things have hype cycles this is no different but even if you were to be really conservative and say, okay, let's it's look at what's real. X. It's still going to be 4X or 3X. Yeah. It's, it's to monstrous. say it's double is insane. Yes. Because we're already at capacity. We, I know. Before it came out, we were like, oh, it, maybe we catch a little break. Like everybody loves the industry growing, but we're still solving problems. I love it, man. I think Jim's going to rock the house tomorrow at this thing talking about uh, energy and power. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think it's a commodity that's just as hard to come now by or more though. So than land, right? And then you, on the other side, I have the brokers coming every year. We have, uh, if it's Cushman, CBRE, JLL, whoever, we bring in someone that, and those brokers get to aggregate data at a pretty massive scale, especially if the large, you know, global ones like JLL and CBRE and Cushman. So they have access to data that I like, I probably have access to, but it would take a ton of analysts hunting to find that data. Yeah. And, and when I'm talking to these guys, like I have Kurt Holcomb and uh, Andy Svengross of JLL coming. And what they are going to talk about is, I remember when those guys were like, you're not going to believe this cloud stuff and what's going on. This is, and I mean, remember when five megawatts and 10 megawatts were right. deals and like, I was with Hayden last night, the COO of Cyrus One. And we were talking, he goes, yeah, I mean, a 300 megawatt deal, it should be like, that's the sweet spot now that we want to be targeting and able to solve for 300 megawatts. Right. I'm like, what happened to those 48 megawatt ones? He's like, yeah, we pick our teeth at those. Right. And I was like, <laughs> I remember when five megawatts were big. Yeah. yeah. And now we're talking about like, I need 300 megs at a click. That's bananas. Yeah. And that's. That's uh, estimated. They're just trying to, they're sticking their finger in the air. They don't know what the adoption rate of these emerging technologies are going to be, right. but they know that they don't want to be left without capacity to support the bursting demand that they're going to have for it. It right. does seem like there's a massive land grab happening right now. And right. land, all those bankers, all those land bankers. Right. And I don't, you know, I mean land in like the literal sense of like land, but like data center capacity, like right. it's everywhere. Least, and they're least building rates. them as fast as they can. As fast as they can, they're limited on supply chain and labor. Right. I'm on the labor side, so I'm like, guys, how do we get in the game here and offer you access to more talent? That's because right. talent's the only way to deliver product. Right? That's one of the benefits of the symposium, by the way, is we get access to some of the best engineering talent at these universities and research institutions, institutions, and it's bringing them as well as their IP into the ecosystem, into the OCP community. I think the thing in general that it impresses me the most with your guys' commitment to academia is. Uh, a lot of those kids are going to be starting college as freshmen. And by the time they graduate, the jobs they may have don't even exist today. Right. And, and those kids are in college 
they're not, I mean, there's very few schools that have a focus on data centers. So those that don't, this is an opportunity for them to be exposed to an industry that they otherwise would have never heard of. That's right. And they don't realize that they can come into this industry and still be in finance or still be in HR or still be in those things. But now they're in a vertical of industry that's in its infancy and exploding. Right. No other industry reinvents itself as fast as this one. Yeah. And that's because this industry is the byproduct of the demand of every other industry airline industry, e-commerce, uh, video caching, you know, everything that you do that requires technology falls back to a data center. So that's why I'm like, man, I, I feel like there's so many more things that um, are going to be busting loose in the next two to three years. Sounds oh, like. yeah. I, it's, I think the change rate is only accelerating um, by a lot. I think that hockey stick is curved way up. You know, you said that we're connected to all these other industries. You know, I, I read a stat the other day. It was like for every person in the data center industry is connected to six other people in the economy, right? At a minimum. And I think that's directly related. Like that's people leasing space. That's people moving dirt. That's like, that's not just someone uses a computer. That's the data center industry directly connected. So yeah, it's it's a massive impact. Our Our impact on a economic scale is only growing at a crazy rate too. Like you have people who quote things like, okay, we're 2% of power consumption globally, maybe moving towards three or five. Um, when you talk about our GDP impact, you know, the economy as a whole, we're coming up quick. It's going to be very, very important over the next couple of years when you start comparing us to things like transportation. Well, if you look at it, data, the number one commodity in the world, we were the industry that thrived the most during COVID because uh, the more that people had to rely on technology to right. survive in a remote environment, it it made us even more recession proof. We were growing at a double digit caker before that. You know, Something's got to make points. those Zoom calls work. Exactly. I think what Microsoft said in the first month of COVID, they had a seven hundred and fifty percent spike in cloud demand. That was like in the first one, week or two, and I, I don't think it. I don't know how much that tapered. I mean, I'm sure it's tapered as groups are trying to bring their workforces back under a roof, but there's a lot of folks that found efficiencies in the way that this unrolled. I mean, we we did as a business too. I mean, I was like, this we're at the forefront of building, you know, uh, as Cyrus Woman call it, the sky for the cloud, which are these big, huge cathedrals that are data centers that right. are filled with all this fancy shit that your guys as nerds feel. And, and at the end of the day, all that ties back to us as the consumer that needs it for our kids to play Fortnite and right. for your right. our significant others to go into Amazon and do some shopping. And I want a DoorDash too tonight. And at the same time, I'm going to see what's going on with my family and social media. Like all those things never stopped. No. Right. So when transportation stopped and logistics stops, we didn't. No. And we're not going to. And it's the more, it turns out the more technology that we make available to the consumer, the higher the adoption rate. Right. So just the more that we could get this shit out. It becomes out, commonplace. The more they could adopt, the more they will. Right. When's the last time you guys have used less technology in what you're doing as a right. regular consumer? Yeah. I mean, I took a technology detox this summer in Yellowstone only because there's no cell towers up there. Is that you know? fantastic? It was great. It was very refreshing. But Wait, man, Charles? I appreciate Yeah, a little bit. A yeah, little bit. I'm checking my phone that just is a clock now. I mean, that's fantastic. a fantastic clock. But it was great. But, you know, you think about things that we were consuming in the pandemic were like traditional consumption, like door dashing and video calls. Like those were all kind of the next things we were all already kind of doing. Like right. this next wave is going to be new stuff, like jobs that aren't created yet, stuff that uses tons of power compared to a Google search. You know, generative AI compared yeah. to consuming data from the internet is way more taxing. I want to see what you, what you... If you put to your community what they think the impact of the fifth industrial revolution will be on them and what they're doing now, that should be the future, right? Because that's where we have a more symbiotic relationship with that technology, hopefully, to where you know our dependency on it kind of levels out as we discover more yeah. that too much of a good thing's a bad thing, right? Yeah. And and there's benefits in going to Yellowstone and unplugging for a week, and there's there's certain things that we do to kind of like I love pizza, but I can't eat it every day, right? And there's I think that there'll be a rotation back. We pivot hard as we want to adopt everything. And then at some point, I think we we learn that we can live without some things too, right? And that's probably something really interesting that um, I hadn't really thought about, but there's there probably needs to be some awareness just in 
our society in general that yeah. like, you know, hey, if you're bored or in the in the bathroom or something, maybe don't go on Instagram for the next 30 minutes. Because Can you imagine? How do people you go really to the bathroom to without Instagram? That. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's been interesting just walking around Austin because I was in San Francisco last week. I'm in Austin this week and seeing a ton of driverless cars. People oh. hopping into an Uber-like vehicle that has no driver and there's all this hardware on the top of them. They're all over the place. Yeah. You talk about, um, you know, being in the car is like, you know, people are like, oh, why are billboard sales going down? You know, people are still driving. They're like, look at billboards. People aren't even looking at the road, man. Yeah. They're stuck in that right. phone. And now when someone else is driving or a robot is driving, they're definitely yeah. in their phones. So the other thing I think we have with our events, like DCAC is a great example. Open Compute Global Summit's a great example, is that high tech, high touch, right? We get focused on these phones and these tools and all these things we can do and we become very, very productive. The other thing that's great is to come together like face to face, see what other people are doing, what are their experiences. And I think it's also a reason why, you know, our events have grown like yeah. crazy too, is because we get stuck in these pockets. We get stuck in our bubbles. There is like a desire to get out there and mix it up and come face to face and yeah. have a good time and learn from each other. That's not digital. I really a lot of organizations is... hold their announcements for our global summit too. So you're going to see announcements from big, big companies and stuff that they've been specifically holding, holding back because they know a lot of people are going to be there. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I'm excited for you guys. Um, let me know how I could help promote that for you. It sounds like it's more critical than most people understand that those things. And it's, and it's, it really is a wow. We make it all about the experience, but it really is a wow in terms of what the community brings together and what they talk about. I mean, there's hundreds of sessions, hundreds of speakers. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, you can, you can fill your day and fill your cup pretty quickly. A lot of nerds, a lot of a lot nerds on one spot. But it's, it's a, it's a great advantage, right? So if you're not the super nerd and you're not dove into that project and you're not contributing at a highly, highly technical level, you can come in and consume and get a broader view of like, okay, where are they on the evolution curve? Like what's coming? Like, what should I be prepared for? That's how I started digesting it. Like, do they have panels on like quantum? Yes. yes. In our we have actually a special purpose track on quantum. There's one on AI, there's one on optics. Do you have people that come in and talk about the worry or the concern? Like Peter Gross a couple of years ago was on stage and he's like, yeah, once quantum's more full spread or mainstream in six years from now, there'll be nothing that uh, that degree of compute won't be able to, from a security perspective, no, right. everything's now hackable. <clears throat> sure. And he's like, yeah, in fact, we're gonna have to go back to analog in a few circumstances of national security potentially. And I was like, interesting, you know, I mean, it makes total sense. Yeah. We have to have a backup plan for everything. Um, quantum is the thing that when I talk to uh, the propeller hats the most about, they're more excited about AI. I wouldn't say they're excited, but they're more intrigued by AI. And when I say quantum, they're like, yeah, it's a whole nother monster, right? Yeah. That That's how they describe it to me. And I was like, damn. And I'm not prepared to understand that at my capacity, it sounds like. So I'm like, all right, we'll break it down for me, right? But what's your, what are you seeing there? And what's the big concern? At, at your summit, do people raise the red flag around, is Elon going to come and say, stop using AI? Or, you know, like, what are the things that you will see that are uh, provocative? You know, it's not really about um, provoking conversation or thing like that. It's about, you know, the, the summit and really our community is more about solving problems, you know? And that's really what OCP is more about is solving challenges and problems. Okay. You know? I, not driving it, just solving it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we do respond to, and, and I think that's how we work efficiently and how we innovate really quickly, right? It's like, what's the problem in front of us or what's the problem coming? Like FDI looks a little further out, right? They look at quantum. That's right. The majority of our community is... Okay, power consumption is and chips are exceeding the limits of air. How are we solving that? Like, and then how how's the ecosystem? How's the whole supply chain going to fulfill this change in this need? I think that's the immediate. That's where most of our content is. I will say you have a lot of propeller ha hats in the room, right? Um, the things you hear in the hallway are those things where you start. You know, we're just socializing. It is a social event as well, too. So, you know, more less direct to our content is you do have questions about like you know, last year it was, you know, blockchain, right? And like, is this good? Is this bad? What are people's, you know? So there's a lot of that happening in discussion, but like Dirk said, most of what we're doing at the forefront is solving problems that are pretty much- But right are those debated, those things? Like, you know, Bitcoin, blockchain, uh, like, are they, you said they're, it's not to provoke, you know, a debate of exchange, but I mean, sometimes healthy friction drives really cool ideas. So do you see those exchanges taking place in a debate? 
Totally. Absolutely, from a but but to to put a more clear point on it, it's about solving technical challenges. As, you know, we what we don't curate is ethical discussions and things like that. Now, when you're talking about AI, of course, ethics do come into the equation and everything. But that's not really what you are curating. That's not really what the purpose of OCP is. Are they important questions and should they be addressed and answered? Absolutely. But our community is much more about the technical solutions and the and the technical problems that we're facing. Cool. Because right. there's a venue for everything, right? And, you know, every venue can't solve every problem, right? I think it also, it just has to evolve. There will one day be a collective right. that, that someone else does that piece on. And That's right. It's just, uh, just keep moving forward on figuring out. And again, the community, these aren't the people to solve the ethical e issues either. These are engineers there to solve technical problems. Would you yeah, agree with that? totally agree. But and to answer your question earlier, I think quantum is going to be a massive disruption. I mean, because I've seen, a, I saw my first quantum computer a few months ago in Montreal on a, uh, when we were there for a conference, and uh, it takes a lot to run one of those things. Now, once you get it up and running, and you see what it can do, it it handles a lot. Of, handles a lot, but um, I'm not worried about what it can it's do. It's a mass. About, ah, well, we have to unplug that one day <laughs> because of what it can do. Right. right? You know, you think of uh, things you know, you hear in the media about AI, right? And from a technical perspective of like, we don't actually understand exactly how it works, right? Like the core <laughs> function of it, like we understand the principles. We don't actually know how it came up with that answer. Exactly. And that hasn't been studied. Oh, AI? They... Just AI. So now take that, which still runs on pretty much basic math principles. Right. It's the next generation, but it's not that different. Quantum's really different. Yeah. So, so it's we don't originating have a, an idea. It's not aggregating what's already posted on the internet and then that's adding right. that. It's creating a new idea. So if we have a hard time understanding AI today, in a couple years, you know, and I don't know what a couple years, quantum's been 10 years away for a long time, right? right? Or 20 years away for a long time. Though, like AI, like liquid cooling, we've been seeing some indications that it's getting a little closer. And there's some real things that are developing where Maybe it is coming a little closer than we're prepared for. And, and it's years we, from being commercialized for sure. That's, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Right. I'm like, I think on military applications, it's advanced already. Right. I think it's not ready for this. I don't think the economy is ready for that either. I think that there's shit to be sold still. Like, same reason why we don't have light bulbs that last 100 years. I mean, we can, but sure. then what would we sell? What would they? What would they sell us? What would we buy? Right. So I think that there's... Like, if you think that they haven't worked on the next iPhone, like, I think the 15 is coming out, right? I, they probably have teams working on the 25, oh, sure. right? But they're like, why would we do that? We could still make money on the other ones first, too, right? So I think that a lot of the things we do, innovation is fantastic, but, you know, there's a finance person behind everything, right? Everything begins and ends with that. It's got a pencil well, too, right? Sure. Like, we're not going to invest into shit that doesn't have a return for us. If it doesn't have an intern on the economic basis, it has to right. have an impact on community or society. Right. Well, we don't do technology for technology's sake right. at OCP. Right. When we solve problems, it's for sustainable, attainable problems, right? It has to pencil out. It has to meet our tenants. It has to solve for a problem that the market is demanding. So we're driven by the market. And and that's what got us. We don't we didn't take plastic off the front of servers and change the layout of it because we could do it. It's because if we did it, we could meet the market in a way that's much better than what existed before it. And that's how everything evolves. Well, let's right. let's let's bring this thing home a little bit, but I, I got a little bit of your personal story. I got some of yours. You started in general construction, you said, though. Which Where were you at before you got into the nerd stuff? Well, so I have a varied past, um, but I grew up around a construction site. Like, gotcha. You know, that sort of stuff. So my grandfather, my brother, and my father yeah, you are, they're carpenters. And um, and so I knew that world and I drove the delivery truck for my dad's business, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? Delivered drywall, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, and then uh, I went to school to become a pilot. And then I worked on um, as a pilot and uh, aircraft maintenance technician. And I loved systems, right? I loved the interoperability of hydraulics and mechanics and electric. And then started in the aviation industry, but then the recession hit. So, so are you a pilot? Yeah. You, you, what, fixed wing, all that stuff? Yeah, fixed wing. All right, cool. Multi-engine, so, commercial, whole deal. I flew skydivers. You ever go, time. you ever be inverted? Sure. <laughs> I just like saying that. It's like from Top Gun. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. Given the bird. Yeah, that's right. So you want to be a pilot. That's pretty awesome. So do you still fly for recreation and shit? Yeah. Like it's a, it's a fun hobby thing. You know, I'll get back to it more as my kids get a little older, you know, yeah. but, um, and there's more time in the day, but yeah, it's, it's just a fun thing. list item for me. I'm going to go get a plane and a license and yeah, it's like it, a time machine. You know? It's on the agenda. It's super fun. Um, I learned that it wasn't the job that I was super passionate about, but I did love how things work and I did love the technology. But the aviation industry doesn't move quite as fast as right. the data center industry does. Yeah. Um, so then I kind of got back coming out of the recession, like back to my roots a little bit, started working project management, 
found my first data center basically through the generator yard. And I've just been working from the back of the transformer to the back of the rack to like, oh, they let me inside the building now hmm. to now being, you know, more at the front of the rack, I guess That's you would pretty say awesome. technology. That's a stuff. cool little evolution. How, uh, tell people like, what else, what else do you want them to know about the OCP? It's, it's transparent, it's free, it's accessible. Come to the website, ask questions. Um, you know, you do not have to be a member to consume or leverage our you community. You have to be an engineer? Nope. Who, like, I wasn't an engineer. Okay. I'm not an engineer. So people that are just um, nerds that like to learn shit, yeah. they could just tag along and this could be something that they get to learn and grow through. And yeah. Have, and, and really the best way to do is um, go to the project page on the website and pick the area of, that's of interest to you that, that you know, uh, might have um, provide a forum for a problem you're trying to solve or you just might be interested in and just sit in on some of the project calls. They have calls every week throughout the, throughout the year. Uh, you can join in the schedule. You can get on the calendar. You can join the mailing list and just start participating. And I, I tell this to a lot of brands that want to come in and start selling to the community. And I'm like, don't just come in and start hitting people over the head. This is an open source community. You got to earn your way. You got to build trust before people are going to want to do business with you. So come in and start participating and just watch and listen and learn for a while and find your place. I like that. That's good advice, actually. Got to go along. Yeah. Get along. Yeah, absolutely. What about you? Anything else you want to add to that? You know, we have webinars all the time too. Like we've been talking about AI. So if, you know, you don't happen to, you know, uh, be at one of these events where you want to hear these people speak, like join on the webinars. There's one on AI, there's one on quantum. Uh, we have lots of things going on all the time. So that's a good way to get familiar with who's who uh, a bit too in our, in our ecosystem and uh, join our mailing list. Okay. And virtually every... At a webinar, every in-person event, we've recorded it and downloaded the PowerPoint. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can go back and just search it by topic matter. You can you can go back seven or eight, eight, nine uh, different summits and go see all the old sessions. You know, and and I would start with the uh, the keynotes because those are higher level, more visionary, longer term in focus. But there's some really interesting stuff in there. And and do you, do you guys participate in other like DCD seven twenty four Afcom? You guys go to other conferences? I know that you speak at well, a lot I'm of places. Here. I know, but uh, but I want to make it something that is part of this every year, right? I want the OCP to always have an area to use this platform to talk about blue sky shit, right? Because the rest of the people that are here are the ones that deal with the, uh, people design things and then someone else got to bring it to life and then someone's got to deliver that stuff, right? And the people that we have are um, a large part of the mass that comes or they fit in that window that yeah. they're tasked with. All right, so this is what the market says we got to do. Let's go figure it out, right? And it's not uh, it's not as easy as some engineer will design sometimes. Sometimes we have to get real creative. Yep. Um, and we want to bring your community into our community as well. Yeah, so. that'd be great. That's well, we I want to hear those about. voices. We talked about it a little bit when we were talking about colos, but you know what is possible in the field? Like people are doing it hands-on. Like we need that feedback. We yeah. need, and part of the reason why, um, you know, we push so hard and, you know, we reached out to you to be part of this community is because we need your voices, your community's voices in our ecosystem as well too. Sure. Because if people can't do it or see it a different way, or maybe find a better way to do something, that's all, you know, that's gravy for us. We want that. I think it's pretty awesome. But what, what would, uh, is there, is there anything you want to tell them about how they could find you? I mean, what's the website or what's the, is it hitting you on LinkedIn? What do you, wh how would you like people to breadcrumb themselves right back to you so they so, can get more involved? So the website is opencompute.org okay. um, and that can get you a path to anything, get you a path to the projects, uh, current events, future events, past events, links to all of our social pages. And we have a, have a pretty active um, social media following on Facebook as well as on LinkedIn and Twitter. Now X, I guess. It, like you guys have a, a summit, their next summit is your annual summit is in October. So we have two, we have about 30 events that we participate in per year, but we have two big ones. We have our global summit that's in October 17th to the 19th in San Jose, California, and you can register and get information about it. You can, the, the full schedule is live now. You can go in and see the detailed schedule. And that's over for anybody? Anybody, Anybody that wants can to pay. Attend. Okay, gotcha. There's a small fee. We're still the cheapest game in town, but that's just because you get breakfast, lunch, and dinner yeah, pretty much every it's day. It's a cost I mean, of doing it's, business. Yeah, exactly. But we have a global summit every fall in October in San Jose. And then we have a regional summit that's focused on the European community every spring. So next year we'll be in Lisbon, Portugal. Oh, nice. Why there? 
Um, you know, we just, well, well, first of all, we bounce around to different locations within um, the European community, but, you know, easily accessible, fairly reasonable. Like you know, we don't we don't go fancy, but we go high quality. So we're looking for easy destinations to get into. And frankly, you know, if somebody's going to travel over to Europe or move from within Europe, we want it to be a place that, you know, they want to go to. But there's also a fairly vibrant data center community in that. Yeah, region. for sure. And growing. Well, that's awesome. Was there anything else you want people to know about either of you that if they didn't get a chance to hear that, anything else that's worth mentioning? I mean, it's, there's, there's something going on in our community that probably matches with something that you're working on. Yep. Right. And it's probably really close to what you're working on. It just takes a couple of Google searches. I think it's awesome that we've arrived to a point as an industry where the stuff that you guys were doing behind the green curtain of Oz is now becoming more main street. So the electricians and the plumbers and the glazers and, yeah. and the low voltage structure cabling people and the people that sell it and deliver it and install it now could be, they're more aware of what they're building. It's like the goal has always been to get to the point where you know, I, I forget who the astronaut was or who the president was when he was in NASA and he was talking to the janitor and he's like, what do you do here? And he's like, I put people on the moon, right? And and you want everyone within this industry to feel inspired by what they're doing and feel safe with what they're doing and be fulfilled by what they're doing. And to do that, they need to understand how they're impacting communities and society. And that's that's what I'm trying to draw this back to because those people that are listening for the first time that have never heard of OPP and do you know me and all you that stuff. Me. Now they have a reason, like it's a challenge for them. Like how dare them not understand the world they live in because they're already building and delivering these products as a byproduct of what you guys are doing. You guys are designing an IT infrastructure solution that we have to put an MEP solution around that allows it to future proof and scale, yeah. right? And and most of those people are like, I'm just here as a part of the cog. I'm like, no, 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 there's a lot of people that have come up and said, hmm, uh, why don't we use this uh, material instead of that one? And why don't we put this underground instead of overhead or- right whatever. And there's a lot of people that move the needle in the industry just by having the opportunity to have a voice. I think, I think we all stand to benefit from when those things happen. But even for me coming from the generator yard, as I understood what we were building for, it was just so much more fulfilling to be that part right? of that whole system. Yeah. And it made me happier at work. So at a minimum, if you come into one call or visit the website one time and you say, oh, that's what we're doing. That's what you're doing. If you're, if you're it's the pulling wire, we do. Yeah. If you're an apprentice pulling wire or something like that's what you're doing. You're touching back to the OCP, but these 4,000 people that are thinking about, you know, the next flux capacitor, mm -hmm. they're putting that down and we have to solve for that. And I think that these people that are going to be at the show, they should know that when you leave the stage tomorrow, they should know that they're already engaged. They just don't realize it should be a challenge for them to connect the dots from where they're at to where the OCP is yeah. and they could understand the disparity and what they need to go lo learn and grow to learn in this industry to be effective and bring value. And right. these are very important challenges that we're solving energy efficiency and sustainability and like being able to, you know, see technology ideas, you know, actually be able to be used, you know, I mean, this is really, really important stuff that we're doing. Oh, that technology improves the lives of everyone around the world. Exactly. That's why we have to continue to do it. It's not just for their Facebook. It's so that That's we right. can get yeah. access to healthcare faster. I mean, just think about Water, getting right? a ride faster. I mean, there's so many things that do from a safety perspective. Technology really is everything. And I think that we're in the, this is an awesome industry. Do you agree? Absolutely. And I don't remember a better time to be in it. And there's a lot of jobs in every different discipline. I mean, I am not an engineer. I'm a marketing guy and I love what I do for this foundation. And, you know, I, I couldn't engineer my way out of a paper bag, but I, I, but I feel like I have an impact in this industry. And I think there's a job for anybody in this industry. Oh, cool, man. Well, listen, is there anything else you guys want to unpackage before we're done? Just thank you. This is amazing. This has been a lot of fun and we really appreciate our partnership with you and your organization. And we, we're yeah. super excited about this event. 